We are joined today by Thomas Duvall, caucuses expert for the Carnegie Endowment. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Good morning, glad to be here. Okay, so in 2003, the book was published, Black Garden, taking an analytical look, if you will, at Karabakh. Since that, uh, really not all that much has changed. So you are getting ready to write a final chapter or another chapter. Another chapter, yeah. yeah. Um, there may be many chapters here. Yeah. Sure, what will be different in that chapter? What's, what's changed? Unfortunately not. I think we're still, everyone, I mean, obviously a lot has happened um, even more so in Azerbaijan than Armenia in the last uh, 10 years uh, domestically and lots happened in Georgia and, and, and stuff has happened in Armenia too. Um, but that's domestic. Uh, situation. If you look at the region as a whole, borders are still closed, um, and the biggest problem remains the Karabakh conflict. Everyone is still, in a sense, prisoners of, of the Karabakh conflict, and, and um, it never. It, again, there have been the moments. Um, I was watching Key West 2001, Kazan 2011 mm -hmm. was another one of those moments. It looks it, like it, it might get done. Everyone pulls back. We're in the same situation. Was Kazan 2011 disappointing for you? It was, um, in a sense, every, what you're always looking for is someone who wants to see this conflict um, resolved. We on a you know, fair and just basis in which um, both sides you know, get most of, thing of what they want, uh, which is possible, is, is a, ga a game changer. And when you see the president of Russia making such a big push, um, when you see President Obama making a telephone call, obviously you're wary because you've seen this movie before, but you think, well, this time it could be different. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't. Yeah, really uh, nothing. No, unfortunately, I've spent uh, the beginning of this interview more or less asking you about nothing because not much has changed. Here's one more. Um, in 2009, uh, you wrote a paper called The Karabakh Trap. Um, in some ways, criticized mostly on the Armenian side, but I do want to read one excerpt. You wrote, to conclude with, I would like to say that there is not any real military solution of the conflict for Azerbaijan and that the military aggression may lead to a catastrophe for the country. Still the same? Absolutely, if, if I think even more so, I think um, the Azerbaijani idea, if you, if you like, I was there in the summer, is um, we're a lot richer, we're a lot stronger, we're now spending um, more on the military than Armenia spends on its entire state budget, and that we will be like um, Reagan bankrupted the Soviet Union, we will bankrupt Armenia with an arms race. Um, they're not talking about war, but they're talking about an um, an arms race that will bankrupt Armenia and force them to be um, make more concessions. I, I think that's a bit of an illusion. I, I think obviously um, it will be a problem for Armenia economically, um, that scenario. But basically as you build up more weapons, um, you end up with mutually assured destruction. I mean, um, it will certainly be very, very costly for Armenians if Azerbaijan were to, were to try something, but it would be horrible for Azerbaijan as well. It would be a much more catastrophic and destructive war than we, the one we saw in, in the 90s, and that, that was bad enough. Sure. Uh, as you know, comments such as the one I read uh, and other comments that you make frustrate the Armenian side from time to time. Um, what do you take of the criticism? I think it's normal. I think both sides uh, live in their realities. Um, a lot of those realities are kind of politically presented realities, and that's understandable that, that, that there's a feeling that, that we can't, um, we have to unify the nation, we, we, we can't show any signs of weakness, um, and therefore when I start suggesting alternative realities, I get criticized. Armenians, I think, are, are more active readers than Azerbaijanis, which is probably, I think, a major reason why I get more criticism from the Armenian side, because they read every single word I read, whereas Azerbaijan is, an, is not such a reading culture. Um, but it's normal. Um, on the other hand, um, I come back here you know, every year to Armenia, Azerbaijan, to go to Karabakh quite often. I have a lot of friends. I have a lot of friendly conversations. So um, you know, it's not as though I'm a persona non grata. Um, I walk down the street and people recognize me and are, are friendly to me. So, so you know, I, I see on, on the private side is actually a lot more friendly to me than, than the public side. Um, the perception for some is that you're uh Pro-Azerbaijan, I, I think to ask such a general question about a complex issue is difficult. So I would ask you what you would say to someone who said that to you. I would say that um, most people in this, on this region, on this conflict, they have the conclusion, and then they, they kind of build the evidence that they find around that. Conclusion there. first, evidence second. Yeah, and I'm a, I'm a British guy with a Dutch name who got interested in this conflict, and I've spent a lot of time on both sides. I've 
done my best to build up the evidence. And, and there are some conclusions which the Armenian side don't like. There are some conclusions that the Azerbaijani side um, don't like. And, you know, um, that's all I would say. Sure. Let's back out a little bit um, and talk about the entire region, including mm. Georgia in the discussion. Uh, if you're looking at three countries, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, uh, state of affairs in 2011, who's ahead, who's behind, kind of uh, break it down if you want. Well, I mean, you know, everywhere, ever, everywhere's got their own particular situation. Azerbaijan, obviously, Baku booming when I was there in the summer. It's Dubai, everything is floodlit, lots of marble, lots of, you know, children's playgrounds, lots of money around. Um, they were all very pleased about Eurovision, etc. Sure. Um, and yet, of course, um, you know, as we all know, oil and gas um, doesn't particularly create jobs. It can create a boom and bust mentality. Maybe in the, in the boom, and ten years down the road, there'll be the bust. And as a, I think, what people don't really understand here is that Azerbaijan is a kind of vulnerable, insecure country, and that Armenia has definitely done its bit by. Um, Obviously, taking Karabakh, but not, but also the lands around Karabakh, which were which weren't Armenian, um, didn't have Armenians in um, before the war. Um, so that, that, in a sense, um, Armenians have done their bit to undermine uh, uh, Azerbaijan's sense of of, of security and, of, and having a state. Um, Georgia, again, I think a lot more self-confident on the surface than underneath. Um, some very successful reforms obviously, in the early Saakashvili period, then the disaster of the war. Um, and now the feeling that really they're a one-party state and the one party doesn't really want to give up power, um, maybe because they fear that the people who come after will undo some of the good reforms. But, but often, you know, for the, for the general reason, the party doesn't want to give up power because they like, like power and, and, it, and it suits them. That's not a new storyline. That's not a new storyline. And Armenia, I think, in a sense, has has changed the least. Um, you know, obviously a bit more prosperity in Yerevan. Um, you know, um, I suppose I noticed more professionalization here um, um, in, you know, in the ministries and so on. Um, but still, you know, many of the same problems people were talking about 10 years ago in terms of um, rural poverty, uh, emigration, you know, again, this kind of democratic deficit, the same, same problems people were talking about 10 years ago. Is the phrase change the least another way of saying done the least and potentially falling the furthest behind your neighbors? Well, yes and no. I mean, I, I think Armenia has certain um, advantages, a, a certain, there's a certain inherent political uh, stability in Armenia that whoever comes to power, um, I think, you know, d um, does not rock the status quo as much as they do in, in, in Georgia or Azerbaijan, There's obviously, and the diaspora is obviously a stabilizing factor. But yes, I mean, economically, uh, um, Armenia is probably in the, in, in the worst shape uh, of all three. And I guess what I always is frustrating about Armenia is you see um, this, this, this potential, um, all those Armenians out there that you meet in, uh, certainly meet in, in, in the US, um, Many of whom would like to come back and work in Armenia, uh, but just don't don't feel that there's there's a place for them, or that there's the right job for them or work for them um, in, in in Armenia. So you, you just you just feel that there's a um, there's a lot of missing potential here. That if you were to reshuffle the cards a lot, uh, Armenia could really have a, a quite an influx of dynamic people who just never quite decide to make it. Let's, Let's uh, kind, of kind of take a, a circular, circular route and tie it all back in and finish with this based, based on, on what, what you just said mm. uh, and, and economy type stuff. stuff. How does that play into whatever, whatever resolution may or may not happen in the next, next year, 10 years, 20 years. years? Well, let me also take a step back and say my general, I mean, I also published a book last year, a little plug, uh, <laughs> called The Caucasus and an Introduction, which is about the whole region. And one of the kind of big conclusions I make there is that it's always the tail that wags the dog in this region. That I, I reject the idea that the great powers sit around deciding what's going to happen in the Caucasus and move pawns on a chessboard. I don't think that's how it works. I think actually local interests start, and then the locals um, appeal to their kind of big brother allies, you help me on this, and, and the locals drag in the big powers. And that's definitely what happened, you know, a little... Um, the Karabakh regional Soviet back in 1988 making its decision, obviously with support from other Armenians. That crisis kind of spread outwards from Stepanakert, and now 
a whole, you know, you could say a whole region which includes, you know, um, um, Caspian Sea, uh, Georgia, Turkey, uh, Iran to some degree. Where everyone's kind of the future uh, development of this region as a region. Everyone's kind of captive. We're all sort of captives of, of, of the Karabakh conflict. So increasingly, I think um, it would be nice if there was some kind of great democratic movement from below, but I don't see that. Okay. And absent that, I think some kind of big regional, almost kind of 19th century style conference where everyone's at the table um, and sit around and say, um, what's your interest? What's my interest? We've got a general interest here. Who can provide what? That that may be the only solution to this conflict. But unfortunately, you know, Russia, US, whatever, Turkey, everyone's got bigger fish to fry, bigger crises. Um, and Karabakh is always sort of somewhere down the list. So it's forgotten. It's forgotten, or there, there's a kind of, you know, there is. We don't there's, forget it. There's some interest. Um, you know, Medvedev obviously took an interest, but um, I, maybe if what that showed was that if one party takes a strong interest and there's not, and doesn't sufficiently engage, um, drag in the others, it doesn't work. So maybe it's, you know, the Russians, um, the, the Americans, the Europeans, the Turks, the Iranians perhaps all need to be at the table for this to work. Thomas Duvall, thank you so much okay. for joining us. I'm Good not sure if what you told us is great or bad or just reality of what is currently going on, but uh, perhaps in the near future we see a resolution and we assume that you'll continue to follow it, so thank you. Yeah, well, I hope to be here on that day. Thanks.